The Lord be with you. And also with you. Friends, welcome to worship this Sunday morning. Uh, you see the announcements that are printed in your bulletin. Uh, I just want to lift up just uh, one that's not on there, just a couple on there. Uh, one thing you hopefully will begin to notice as we continue uh, with our services is um, the call to worship. Uh, it's going to be taken from the Psalms. And if you notice, last Sunday we started with Psalms 1, and today we're picking up with Psalms 2. And we're just going to go through, and I'm going to be using the Psalms for our call to worship for the next however long it takes us to get through 150 of them. So uh, it's, it's a, a, a way to draw our focus. One of my goals as your pastor is to um, focus our attention on the Scripture, on, on the Bible, uh, there's a reason why this is here, and there's a reason why it's opened to Psalm 119. That's the, the great psalm of God's word. Uh, so every little thing about our worship, I'm, I'm making it point us to God's word. Uh, so again, that's, that's what you'll notice is our call to worship. And then the other thing I forgot to mention last Sunday uh, was uh, this, this, has been, this was a decision the mission team made back in December uh, but in light of COVID, we're actually going to uh, postpone our mission trip to Puerto Rico, which would have been this year. Uh, we're postponing it for another year. Uh, the um, Praying Pelican Missions, that's the organization we're doing it through. Uh, they're, they're being gracious and wonderful, and uh, they'll hold a similar spot for us for next year. Uh, and so we can continue to raise funds and, and send it to them, and uh, they'll continue to hold that spot. So... Uh, it'll be, um, it, we're, it's, it's a blessing in, in that regard. So uh, just keep that, the mission trip and team in your prayers. Uh, but we are putting a, a hold on the Puerto Rico mission trip for this year. But that means we, we now have some opportunities perhaps for something local. Uh, so begin brainstorming and the mission committee is brainstorming about that. Are there any other announcements this morning? All right. Well, seeing none, let us prepare our hearts to worship the Lord.
morning. Hear now our call to worship from Psalms 2, verses 1 through 6. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Jesus teaches, go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. In light of this teaching, let us offer our prayer of confession. Almighty God, we repent of all the ways we turn from you. You call, but we prefer. You show us the path but we prefer our own way. Forgive us, heal us, and lead us back to you. 
that we might joyfully trust and obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. People of God, our sins are forgiven. For the Lord who made all things knows our weaknesses. Therefore, let us turn away from the sin and obey the ways of the Lord. Reconciliation is ours through Jesus Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please join me in prayer. God of redemption, summon us to Abraham's wonder. Sarah's joy and Paul's confident hope through the word and work of the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today comes from Genesis 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning of the first day. This is the word of the Lord. God has given us life in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In gratitude, let us offer our hearts and the first fruit of our labor to God's service.
Thank you, Linda. This is going to bother me. Let us dedicate these offerings with this prayer. Almighty and merciful God, from whom comes all that is good, we praise you for your mercies, for your goodness that has created us, your grace that has sustained us, your discipline that has corrected us, your patience that has borne with us, and your love that has redeemed us. Help us to love you and to be thankful for all your gifts by serving you and delighting to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Friends, now we enter the portion of our service where we lift up our prayers for our families, for our friends, for the church, and for the world. You see the prayer requests that are printed in the bulletin. Are there any others you wish to lift up at this time? Yes, Jean. We'll certainly keep the folks at Autumn Care in our prayer, everyone, staff and residents. Thank you. Yes, Jenny. Oh, this is for Holly. Um, she has cancer for the second time. Mm -hmm. She went okay back. Yeah. She's not okay. She's okay. Yeah. We'll certainly keep your sister Holly in our prayers. <clears throat> Any other prayer requests? Well, seeing none, let us bring these prayers to the Lord. O oh Lord and Father of the household of faith, we pray for the church in all her breadth and variety, gathered out of every nation, family, people, and tongue, to be the kingdom of priests serving you. We pray for the church in all the world, for churches in North America, Europe, in the Middle East, for churches in Africa, Asia, in Latin America, for young churches and old churches, for small churches and large churches, for weak churches and strong churches. Grant to the church true lowliness and genuine humility where there is pride, unity where there is division, and grant to her truth where there is error and wisdom where there is folly, that you might fulfill your purposes for her. O Lord and Father of the household of faith, we pray for those stewards to whom you have entrusted the affairs of your house, for pastors, elders, lay leaders, volunteers, and committees. Give them the spirit of willing service and true humility. Give them a sense of spiritual devotion. Give them delight in those whom they serve. Grant that they may lead your people in the way of Christ, that thereby we might all enter the land of our heritage. O Lord and Father of the household of faith, we pray for our nation and those who lead this nation, for the president and his advisors, for Congress and the courts, the diplomatic corps as they negotiate for peace. We pray for our armed forces, for those deployed abroad and those stationed at home. Keep them from harm's way. And we pray for emergency response units, police officers, firemen, EMTs, and healthcare professionals. O Lord and Father of the household of faith, we pray for those who have special needs, to all who suffer any sickness or weakness, especially those with the coronavirus, grant healing and strength. To all who are disturbed or troubled, Give rest and understanding. To all who are lonely and alienated, give fellowship and love. To all who grieve and sorrow, especially at the loss of someone, grant comfort and assurance. To all who are aged and frail, give homes of comfort and safety and others to help them and the willingness to accept help. All these requests we present to you, O Father of mercy, in the name of Jesus Christ, who even now is seated at your right hand to intercede for us and who will come at the last trumpet to gather us into his holy city, the Jerusalem that is above and toward which we journey even now. And now we are bold to pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, last week we returned to our expository series on the Gospel of Mark. In that uh, series, in that sermon, we looked at the eternal riches of fellowship with Christ and the resulting earthly denial. St. James, the brother of Jesus, sums up our Lord's teaching. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, this teaching troubled the disciples, as I, assure, as I assume has probably troubled many of you. And that springboards them into our passage for this morning. So I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word, which comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us what we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism which I, which I am baptized? They said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink. And you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to be, become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Grant, Almighty God, by your Spirit, that you destroy the wickedness of our heart and restore to us a sound mind that we may sincerely cling to you until at length you gather us into that blessed rest. Amen. Well, here we see Jesus and the disciples, and Mark tells us that they are on the road going up to Jerusalem. It's the same road. They're still on this road. Uh, pretty much almost all of chapter 10 takes place on this road. It's the same road on which the rich man questioned inheriting eternal life. It's the same road on which the disciples relearned the cost of discipleship. And here in this instance, we see for the uh, third and final time, Jesus predicts his suffering and death. Now we're going to elaborate more on the details of the passion and crucifixion when we get there in the gospel. For now, I just want to mention two quick points. First of all, the disciples should not have been surprised by the passion. They should not have been taken uh, caught off guard by Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. They should not have been aghast at his betrayal. 
because Jesus warned them. Three times he warned them. And yet surprise is exactly how they acted. Even today, especially today, we let Jesus' teachings go in one ear and write out the other. Three times Jesus might tell us something. Loud and clear, Jesus will tell us something. And yet we will let it go in one ear and out the other. Or worse, we blatantly ignore it. And the second point is this. The, the disciples should expect the same for them. For the student is never greater than the master. Jesus is the mold for discipleship. And this includes his persecution and death. So the disciples were warned that what happens to Jesus, both the good and the bad, will happen to them. And as we discussed last week, we should not be alarmed by persecution. We should not be taken by surprise by persecution because Jesus tells us it will happen. But the disciples missed the point entirely. Instead of hearing the good news that three days later he will rise again, that's the, the best news. Instead of listening to that, instead of grabbing on to that, James and John decide to ask Jesus for a favor. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. You ever watch movies where, where the, when the character says, do me a favor? You're always a little bit hesitant. What's going to happen to that guy? What's going to happen in the plot? Do us a favor, Jesus. It's interesting that that's what they thought of. Instead of listening to the good news, instead of listening to the, to the persecution, they said, do us a favor. What more do you want from him, James and John? He just told you that he's going to be arrested, be scourged, be executed, be resurrected. What is it that you could be asking more from Jesus? How could you be so narrow-minded as to miss the point? How could you be so narrow-minded as to miss the truth of the good news of the gospel? How many of you here know what the gospel is? You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you know what the gospel is? Is it a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Is it winning souls for the kingdom? Is it advocating for the marginalized? Is it an emotional response to Scripture? Church, the gospel is this. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him and three days later he will rise again. So do you know what the gospel is? I'll tell you. The gospel is Jesus. And Jesus is the gospel. That is what we need to put in our minds. Everything else may point us to Jesus. Everything else may elaborate about our relationship with Jesus. But those are not the gospel. The good news is Jesus. And yet James and John missed the point. Their question makes me think of adapting that one JFK quote. Ask not what your Savior can do for you. Ask what you can do for your Savior. The funny thing is, Charles Spurgeon said as much a hundred years before Kennedy uttered those famous words. Jesus literally gave his all for you and for me. Yet how many times do we go when we ask him for more? Oh, Jesus, give me comfort. Oh, Jesus, give me happiness. 
Oh, Jesus, give me health. Oh, Jesus, give me family. Oh, Jesus, give me, give me, give me, give me. Church, you need to stop asking Jesus for favors and start asking how you can serve your master. It burns me up seeing Christians living moment by moment attempting to circumvent Christ or seeking favors from him. Oh, if you do this for me, Jesus, I will do anything for you. I will do such and such for you. I will give my life for you. I will give all this money for you. I will give to you my firstborn son. Or worse, I will do this such and such in spite of the Bible's teaching. Because doing that thing makes me feel good. Because doing that thing makes me feel validated. Because doing that thing gives me happiness. Church, what is it that you are doing that is displeasing to God but brings you happiness? Think on it and weigh on it and then repent of it. Because that is not discipleship. That is not servanthood. What that is, is pride and arrogance and disobedience. And what are things that God hates? Pride, arrogance, and disobedience. And so in their own pride, James and John ask, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. Instead of thinking about Jesus' arrest and suffering. Instead of mourning the idea of, of being scourged and crucified. They're thinking about honor and prestige. Instead of thinking about Jesus' death and resurrection. Instead of thinking about the pain and suffering that he would endure. They're thinking about positions of power. When you're in your glorious Reign as Israel's true king, O oh Jesus. Let us sit in places of honor and be your governors, is essentially what they are saying. But here's the thing the game of, or excuse me, the king of God is not like the Game of Thrones. You can't go and try to, to win favors, you can't backstab your way to the top. There's no magical dragons to save you. And yet we think this way all the time. We ponder more about the here and the now than we do about eternity. Now some accuse Christians of, of being so heavenly minded they're of, earth, they're of no earthly good. You've heard that phrase before? That may be true. But I know too many Christians who are so earthly minded that they are of no kingdom good. They are absolutely useless to God. They are absolutely dismissive of the redeeming work of Christ. When we forget about eternity, we, for we forget about our call on earth. We forget about why we are here. Because certainly we do live in the here and now. But if we aren't thinking about eternity, then what are we doing? We're reveling in the here and now. We think the here and now is all that there is. And so we focus more and more on our personal desires, on our personal comforts, on our personal happiness, that we forget what God desires. We forget that God has given us commands. James and John were thinking with earthly minds about heavenly affairs. They want Jesus to grant them something, but they presently fail to grasp the cost of discipleship. 
So Jesus reproves their, think, their thinking. Christ replies to their request, Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? There's a lot of meaning in cup and baptism, and we need to unpack this. First of all, this particular reference is not an allusion to the two sacraments, though the sacraments do allude back to this symbolism. To drink the cup is a symbol of God's wrath. Psalm 75, verse 8. For a cup is in the hand of the Lord, and the wine foams. It is well mixed. And he pours out of this. What does he pour out of this? Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. Isaiah 51, 17. Arise, O Jerusalem. You have drunk from the, hand, the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, the chalice of reeling. You have drained to the dregs. Jeremiah 25, 15. For thus the Lord, the God of Israel, says to me, Take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. Ezekiel 23, 33. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, the cup of horror and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. You will drink it and drain it. We cannot forget that God's Wrath was poured out on Christ. We shudder, and we should shudder, but we should be thankful because that wrath is not poured out on the elect. That wrath is not poured out on God's children because he poured it out on his only son. We'll discuss this a little bit more when we get to Mark 14. I just want you to see what the Bible, God's word, what it means when it says to drink the cup. And then to be baptized is also a symbol of dread. It's a symbol of judgment. In this context, this is not baptism as a new creation. Rather, this is the outward sign of the inward reality of regeneration. It's more like this. This is what it is like. When you think about this baptism that Jesus has in mind, he's thinking about the flood of judgment on the sinful world in Noah's day. He's thinking about the Red Sea of judgment on wicked Pharaoh's army in Moses' day. Psalm 42, 7, Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls, all your breakers and all your waves have rolled over me. Psalm 90, set, excuse me, 69, 1. Save me, O God, for the waters have threatened my life. When Jesus talks about the, the cup and the baptism that James and John ought to share, they will experience the full persecution that every disciple of Christ endures. And so Jesus asks them if they are able to truly follow him when it hurts. That's the question he asks us. Are we, are you, church, following Christ when it really hurts? Now, since their response is written, we don't know how they said we are able. Their initial question is certainly presumptuous. So I safely assume that their response is overconfident at best. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, we are able, Jesus. Yeah, we can do that. There might be some apprehension there, but they're like, yeah, 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 we'll, 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 we'll follow you, Jesus. Our Lord recognizes their requests and he promises more than they fully understand. He says, the cup that I drink you shall drink and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. And indeed, both James and John did experience the same persecutions of their Lord. 
Acts chapter 12, verse 2 records that Herod had James put to death with a sword. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9 records that John was exiled on the island of Patmos because of his testimony of Jesus. Are you willing to be put to death? Are you willing to be exiled from your home, from your family, from your nation because of the testimony of Jesus? Now the difference between their suffering and that of Christ is significant. Jesus' suffering was part of his atoning sacrifice. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So what Jesus experienced was for a reason. And that reason was redemption. That reason was to experience the fullness of God's wrath. But the suffering of the apostles, and indeed our suffering as well, is not in contribution to the atonement, but is the painful price of proclaiming the gospel. Nowhere in Scripture does it say living the Christian life is supposed to be comfortable. Out of not a single mouth of any apostle comes the words, the Christian life is easy. Now while they would get to share in the Lord's suffering, to sit in positions of honor, Jesus says, is for those for whom it has been prepared. Now this can be taken two ways. One, it can be taken in light of Jesus' crucifixion, and the other is in light of his resurrection. If the former, in light of Jesus' predicting his suffering and death, i.e. The, the, that physical moment of crucifixion, he is telling them that the positions on my right and on my left are reserved for the two criminals who would be crucified alongside him. And so in that case, the, the dread honor of dying with Christ is not theirs to be had, but is reserved for two others. Now, if it's the latter, in light of Jesus' predicting his resurrection, he tells them that honors in the heavenly kingdom are not bestowed on the basis of selfish ambition, but rather on the sovereign will of God. In this case, their overconfidence and their worldly ambition are rebuked by Jesus, and he sharply reminds them that the cost of discipleship is great, but the honors of heaven are reserved for God's will. Now, both of these are appropriate, and nothing says one outshines the other. But the main teaching is this. God the Father has our place established. This comforts, at least it should comfort, and it does comfort the genuine Christian. It soothes the weary and the anxious heart that God has our places established. We need not fear, because God, from whom comes every good and perfect gift, and who works all things for the good of his elect, has prepared a place for us. Church, there is a lot of fear out there. I know there's a lot of fear in your lives. But we don't need to fear. Because there is a sovereign God who has control over everything. There is no maverick molecule in this world. The Lord God will protect you. And if the Lord God is going to call you home, you're going to go. There's no stopping him. And so we need not 
fear. We need not live in fear because we have a hope. Hearing their request and Jesus' response, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. This is a sad contrast that Mark presents for us. The master's thoughts centered on his death for others. That's what Jesus was talking about. Yet the disciples' thoughts occupied petty jealousies of who should be greatest. Why? Because all of them were of the same mind as James and John. When they heard James and John saying they wanted honorable positions, while the other ten were like, oh, but, but what about us? We want honorable positions too. Isn't that how we act naturally? We want the best for ourselves, for our family the best food, the best health care, the best schools, the best jobs. How would things be different if with the same zeal and energy we wanted the best for others? Jesus wants the disciples, Jesus wants us to purge worldly notions of power and honor. He says the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. It is natural for fallen men to lord authority over another. Indeed, we just look at the testimony of secular history. Men love power. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. For the most terrible kings to the bossiest of managers, one thing is in common. Leadership is authoritarian. Authoritarian leadership is characterized by worldly notions of honor, which is what Jesus wants to rid from his disciples. Those in positions of high regard wield their power those who sit at the despot's right and the left hand. Those are the people the, the tyrant leader trusts are those on his right and on his left. They are the ones who he sends out to do his bidding. And anyone who stands in the way of authoritarianism is a foe to be dealt with, to be destroyed. That is not what Jesus wants in our minds and in our hearts. Now there's a fine line between authoritarianism and God-given authority. Church officers must take a firm but loving stance in the matters of faith. God-given authority is necessary for disciplining believers, for reconciling those who are sinning and bringing them back into union and fellowship with their Lord. Authoritarianism, rather, is destructive. It's penal, punitive. It wants to bring about uh, the, the will of the leader. But God-given authority brings about and points us to the will of God. Paul, just a biblical example, Paul had the power to be authoritarian, but he recognized that there was this fine line. He asked the Corinthians how they preferred he correct their errors. He asked them. He said, shall I come to you with a rod? Shall I come in there with this stick and beat you with it? Or with love and a spirit of gentleness? He reminds Philemon, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper. He could have told Philemon exactly what he needed to do. 
Yet, for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, says the apostle. Paul had the power to be authoritarian, but he was motivated by gentleness and love and recognized that God-given authority is about reconciliation and not retribution. The events of the night of January 6th stand in stark contrast to this biblical teaching. I saw clips of, of people, what happened in D.C., hoisting up crosses and waving Christian flags. Christians cannot appeal to violence regardless, listen church, regardless of the cause. When Peter lifted the sword to defend Jesus in Gethsemane, what did Christ say? He rebuked Peter and said, for all who take the sword will die by the sword. While being stoned for the gospel, the apostle Paul never raised an arm in violence. Rather, he got up after being stoned outside of Lystra. He got up and went back into the city and continued preaching. To take up arms for freedom, for black lives, for all lives, even for the gospel, runs contrary, listen church, runs contrary to the message that we preach. Now, does this mean we must be pacifists? I don't think so. While we must be nonviolent, our call is nonetheless prophetic calling people to repentance. That is our role as believers. That is my role as your shepherd, as your under-shepherd, is to call people to repentance. President-elect Biden needs to repent. President Trump needs to repent. Congress needs to repent. Governor Northam needs to repent. The church can and must call our worldly leaders to repentance. But we should not be surprised. Here's the thing, church. We should not be surprised when godless rulers lord their authority. And so Jesus commands believers to practice servant leadership. Now what is servant leadership? I want to close by describing it with at least these three things. There's more. I believe servant leadership is much more than these three, but it contains at least them. Gentleness, humility, and love. Gentleness. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 to 25, the apostle says the Lord's bond servant, excuse me, Paul says the Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome. So he's talking here, telling Timothy about what the servants of the Lord are. They must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. Servant leaders are called to flee belligerence, to flee violence, and pursue kindness, pursue elucidation, pursue patience, instructing and admonishing with gentle. Notice Paul says there is instruction and admonishing. There is calling to repentance. There is calling out sin. There is calling out wrongdoing. But it is with gentleness. And then there's humility. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, and then verse 7. Paul says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. 
So not from selfish ambition, but with humility of mind. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Hmm. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, says the apostle, but also for the interests of others. For this is the example of God, verse 7, who emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. Servant leaders are called to unite the church with humility. Meaning humility is submitting to the word and the will of God. If you think you know better than God, you are not being humble. The church must submit humbly and obediently to God. Not just for the sake of unity in the church, but as conformity to the very mindset and the very attitude of Christ. Because Christ, who came in the form of bondservant, he, he humbled himself in obedience to the Father. He followed the commands of God. And we are called to do the same. And lastly, love. Colossians 3, verse 12. As those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, those who are chosen by God, listen to this, holy and beloved, put on, Paul is saying, put on a heart of compassion, of kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We've heard a couple of these words before already. Verse 14. Beyond all these things, so you have all those things. And beyond them, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Servant leaders are filled with love. They're filled with love for people, a love for one another, a love for fellowship, and a love for God, and a love to do his will. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We don't do these commandments, we don't follow the commandments to earn his love. We are responding to his love with a love of our own. And that love manifests in obedience to Christ. This love is the adhesive of the church. It's the spiritual cord that binds and holds God's people together. Because if we don't have a love for Christ, if we don't have a love for one another, then we can never obey him and serve him. So we must always remember that Jesus came as the suffering servant to redeem us. In our imitation of Christ, we must not forget that we are to imitate both his gentle, humble, and loving witness. That's the easy part. And here's the hard part. And we must imitate his willingness to suffer for the gospel. Now, if you don't have these things in your heart, I want to invite you especially to join me in this prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, where there is overconfidence and self-ambition, God, I ask that you remove it. Strike it from the heart. Remove it from the desires and replace it with humility. Lord God, where there is worldly honor and indignation, remove it, strike it, and replace it with a spirit of gentleness. And where there is fear and trepidation, remove it and replace it 
with obedient, sacrificial love. Amen and amen. Church, I invite you to stand. And in light of this teaching of God's word, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Church, receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And out of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go out into this world and serve the Lord as a bondservant of righteousness. Amen. Thank you.